So welcome everyone again. I am uh, Nisreen Shahadi from Afikra and uh, this is another episode of our conversation series and specifically our outline series where we talk about one specific project and we're very excited to have with us Carol Sansur and Carol is uh, the co-editor of The Sultan's Seal and host of an occasional video podcast. She is an agitator, social provoker, and campaigner who has an interest in post-national, post-gender, and post-religion identities. She is a proud mother and partner, and she works and resides in Athens, Greece. So welcome, Carol. Thank you, Nisreen. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It's such an honor and pleasure to, to have this opportunity to talk with you. And uh, before we get started, um, I would just, you know, love to hear from you uh, kind of how you got uh, started as a, a poet, how you began writing, um, you know, just a, a little bit about who That's you one are. of the difficult questions that I ask. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, all I know is that uh, for a while, for a long time now, before the Mishmish, film Mishmish was um, uh, published, I used to uh, jot down stuff. I used to write, basically. Oftentimes, I also used to write uh, opinion pieces that were published in the local newspapers or, uh, you know, Arabic newspapers around the Arab world. Um, but uh, it was around 2012 where um, I uh, was um, taken seriously by others as somebody who writes uh, poetry, I have to say, and uh, was encouraged to really focus and, and start writing. Uh, uh, I never took up their uh, advice, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I never took myself seriously about writing until um, later in life, I would say in 2018, where um, there was enough material to come up with uh, Phil Mishmish. Wonderful, yes. In the time of the apricots. In the time of the apricots, yes. And that is um, the work that we're going to be discussing today. So is this, um, you know, tell us a little bit briefly about um, what this is, you know, when somebody, if somebody were to receive it, what would they, what would they find? Uh, this is a very small pocket size uh, poetry collection. Um, it is a personal account uh, of my life uh, in a certain period of time, and uh, it is a new Palestinian poetry, I would say, in a shape that might not have been introduced to the world in that, in that way. What's interesting about it is it's also almost like an art object because it is designed in a very nice way and also um, has um, the mishmish in three languages, the poetry in three languages, English, French, and Arabic. Yes, that's uh, definitely uh, an amazing aspect to it. It's, uh, it. It opens with the Arabic. And then what I noticed is that the, the French and the English, um, the, the poems are actually in the reverse order. Was that something intentional or was that something uh, that kind of happened? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we had. It was a tricky thing to to do because how do you? If you have noticed, I don't know, Nisreen, that the book doesn't is not even doesn't have num page numbers. It's mm. not numbered like that, because mm. we we in the discussion of how to produce this object, we didn't know how to best place the English, the Arabic, and the French. So if you're reading from left to right, you end up reading the French and the, the Arabic, the French and the English. If you're reading from right, sorry, from left to right, you would read English, French and Arabic and right and right to left, it would be Arabic, French and English. So it depends on how you, you look at it and, and where do you start, but they all have the same exact um, work. Oh, absolutely yes yeah and that's interesting i mean so much of like our um just logistical decisions sometimes are really impacted by this uh, opposing um directionality of the language so it's, mm -hmm. it's 
meeting? It was a very tricky thing because the text in Arabic alone is a very short text, I have to say. And it is a, a pocket, uh, it's almost like a leaflet kind of thing. Yes. Uh, and uh, and we, we, I personally was um, lucky enough to have it translated into English and French as a, um, an effort of, or, or a work of love, really, not, not, I mean, nobody was compensated or asked to, to do it. So it's just that individuals loved it and um, wanted to, to, uh, to translate it. And considering that it was a shame not to publish the three languages, it was just the right thing to do. Um, even though everybody advised against publishing in three languages, because how do you really market a project in three languages? I mean, it's not an Arabic book, it's not a French book, it's not, in so many ways, this has been a, a, a funny place uh, I am at with uh, this, this project, but I'm loving it. That's wonderful, great. Uh, so let's, I'm gonna just uh, move on to our first question here is kind of what were you doing uh, before you actually started working on this project? What was kind of your, your focus? Uh, uh, again, because I wasn't into writing as a vocation, it's not a call per se, I was doing my professional job, which was in Abu Dhabi, I was in Abu Dhabi for 12 years, and uh, I was doing um, uh, PR and communications for public health, so mm. that, that was my domain, but, you know, parallel, the, the film mishmash was ongoing, but I wasn't aware of it as a project per se. And I'm curious also, uh, sometimes, you know, there are many iterations of a project, you know, and many sort of ways to conceive of it. Um, was, you know, what was the first uh, version of the name of the project? Did, did it always have the name in mind? Uh, it, it was, was never a project, but, you know, until uh, you know, much, much later stage. It was just writings. And some of the poems were published actually separately, whether in Al Quds al Arabi or in the Khitm al Sultan, which is the Sultan Seal um, uh, blog. Uh, but it, you know, it was never thought of yet, at least not in 2000, not before 2018, that this is going to be a book Interesting. or a project. Yeah. And, and so what, what was that moment that it actually was like, no, this needs to be a book? Uh, I was visiting a friend of mine who's a great supporter, Umayya Abu Hanna in, in Holland. And uh, we were just chit-chatting and we usually don't stop chit-chatting. And, uh, and she was like, but Carol, come on, you do have enough material. So you go back to Abu Dhabi and start thinking about a book. She just like, start thinking about a book. Of course, I was not taking her seriously, uh, but then we kept on talking about the possibility and the potential of a book. And then my great friend, Yusuf Racha, decided, he was also involved and we we're involved in, in, in other projects. And he's, um, He's like, of course, yes. I think this is a good idea. You should, you should put the, put it together as a as a as a book. And uh, th this was where it just started brewing. I mean, still, I'm not believing that <laughs> this can be a book. And yeah, yeah. You know, I think you, um, you speak to something that is really very uh, universal. I think for many artists, uh, whether it's you know wh whatever the medium is, is that when do we give ourselves permission to to feel that to take ourselves seriously as you said mm. before mm. um you know is it is it with the publishing of a book is this what makes us now you know an a, a, a legitimate poet or you know what what is that moment where all of a sudden we feel mm. Mm. Uh, that uh, what we have is is sort of uh mm worthy of putting out to the world you yeah know? and i think that is a very tricky thing because honestly in so many ways um i've i've noticed um that after having it physically as a book people started paying attention 
But without, before that, I was already publishing some of my poetry. So it didn't matter to me. It was actually outdated once it was out as a book. It was an outdated, for me, uh, text. Uh, but um, but it was only then that I felt that a number of people really started taking me seriously. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting observation and a sad, uh, experience. One. <laughs> a sad one, I have to say, because I mean we could discuss that what what is publishing, you know, absolutely in, in the current form, you know, right, mm -hmm. right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so I have, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, here we have this question about, you know, what, who are the five unlisted co-founders uh, who you've never met, but inform your work. And I have kind of in the back of my mind, so I, I'll let you answer, but I um, kind of an idea or a question about who those might, might be, um, you know, who kind of influenced uh, or maybe like even from before this was even an incept of a, an idea to publish a book, um, who, who would you kind of point to? Yeah, I think um, it's who, who informs, who, who am I, you know, in so many ways. My, my work is who, who is Carol, really. And uh, it, it's, it wasn't clear for me in the beginning, but if I read now more and more, I know what I'm talking about. I know who influences me, you know, like my mom is a hero. My mom is there. She's like, uh, yeah. Uh, and then it, funny enough, and I don't know if this fits your uh, criteria of a co-founder, it's my hometown. It's, it's all of a sudden the, the other big player in this uh, work is my hometown. And um, I have to say, I, ha I wasn't aware of how much my hometown had an influence or had, you know, there's something about it. it only when I left to Abu Dhabi for, you know, for 12 years, and, and this work was done in Abu Dhabi, it wasn't done anywhere else. Um, and of course, all the anger, if, if, <laughs> if that's also another uh, personality playing a role, it's like my, my frustration and anger of of what have what have we become or what are we now? It's just like not that I don't know what were we before, but my presence is just something that agitates me and and drives me up the wall. And yeah, I think it, it influences my work. Mm -hmm. mm. I, yeah, I have to say I'm very um, intrigued and I love how, you know, using or naming, you know, anger and your hometown. You, you're from Bejala, correct? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, that those, yeah, these are the things that influence us and shape us. And it's not necessarily a person. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder, uh, you know, I'm not sure if, you know, how... Um, how this, work, figures, don't yeah, worry. Yeah. <laughs> how this figures into your own uh, thinking. But I, in reading about your work, I, I noticed Mahmoud Darwish uh, was referenced a couple of times um, as kind of the, the, um, the Palestinian poet. And it was like kind of juxtaposed with you and your work. Um, did, has he played any, like just in terms of like the, not necessarily his work, but like the idea of him, um, has that factored in? Yeah, at all? I mean, the idea of him, the idea of Fairuz, the idea of Uncle Thum, the idea of Abu Ammar, the idea of Jamal Abdel Nasser, all of those things is just like, give me a break. Yes, fine, you, you can love them, but I don't have to love them, you know? Uh, so the, this um, uniformity, this one voice, this, I think, in so many ways, th this was also something that I struggle, I continue to struggle with, to be honest, uh, not with my writing, with my existence. Like if I am an Arab, I am defined, or there is a framework of who I am, and I, I come with a certain baggage. I need to listen to Fairuz in the morning and read Mahmoud Darwish. And, and even like, it, this is not only something that uh, I mean, there are things that are great, of course, out there, but uh, I think it 
when you keep comparing creatives with such big names for whatever reason, for whatever reason they are big names, I think it, it puts a cap on the possibilities of change, the possibilities of uh, creativity, because people, when they read my poetry, they compare it to something that they know this is poetry. But if, so if my work is not matching what's poetry in their head, then oh, everybody can write this, forget it, you know? So, and I think, yeah, that's a, that's a huge challenge. And I think not only for Arabs, but it's has taken much, much longer for us to break the, this making gods out of things. Mm. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. And, uh, and by virtue of exactly being, um, being just different and sort of counter to that, it's, mm. it's where exactly does your place then lie? Um, so that's a, a very fascinating space mm. to explore. Um, uh, so let's move on to the next, let's keep moving. Uh, so if you could, you know, of course, uh, a project never kind of follows maybe a direct line, you know, what are some of the things that created some friction or slowed you down before you launched? Well, the, the first big obstacle was me believing that this is a project I want to uh, make sure that, you know, I undertake. And this was a huge thing for me to, to say, okay, yes, we'll do it. Uh, but then publisher, you know, just finding a publisher was, uh, again, because the, the understanding of what, it's not even finding a publisher, it's finding a publisher who's willing to, uh, you know, I had a few who refused to publish the text because it uses certain language, you know, certain terminologies. It's like even, um, they wanted to change it. And there was also like, you're a new person, so we need to help you. This kind of always like, to help me to them meant that I all of a sudden will start writing differently. And this was an impossible thing for me because honestly, I think one of the beauties of this project is that it was published the way I wanted it to be published. It wasn't published with any editing, with any. So, and and the ideas and the and the terminologies and the expression it uses had to be there. Otherwise, it wouldn't be my work. Mm. So yeah, th this this was the the, the other obstacle. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, other than that, I think it 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 went smoothly because again, it was an act of of love and, and fun and, and excitement other than that, yeah. Can you um, elaborate a little bit more on the, when you say the terminology, because uh, something else that I read was that you do uh, sort of easily trans um, go between uh, the more poetry the versus, yeah. versus um, like uh, you're writing in kind of a, the colloquial, the yeah. correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it wasn't the, 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 the stress, at least with a couple of uh, publishers uh, who are, you know, Palestinians, they just didn't think that Palestinian poetry can have, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, foul language, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm. And I think our life is full of foul language. I mean, <laughs> and why, why do you want to censorship this one? Or to touch on issues that might be sensitive with religion or, you know. Absolutely. Uh, so th those things, this is why I wanted to write this. I wanted to write the things that touch me. So there was no point of censoring this. Absolutely. So, I, you know, another um, quote that kind of, came out for me uh, reading uh, Yusuf Racha, actually the, the translator of your poems into English, mm -hmm. says, um, you know, the power of your work lies in the effortless way it subverts received accounts of both the Palestinian cause and Arab womanhood. 
And it seems like that this is kind of what you're touching on that, you know, you're, you're pushing back on this. And is that something that you feel that you really were very consciously set out to do? And not consciously. I mean, the only conscious thing that I am setting out to do in my daily life and in my work is to be myself. I mean, I don't have to be anybody else. And I don't have to go by anybody's rules and, and guidelines. And I think that is, I didn't know um, that it was such a challenge <laughs> to just say, this is how I want things to be said. I don't want to change them, you know? So, yeah. Um, uh, I never thought of myself as a woman. I never thought of uh, myself as a Palestinian. I, I think of myself as a person who has, I like things, I hate other things and, and so on and so forth. So, and, and this is what I want to move with in my life. Mm -hmm. Be yes. true to myself. Right. Right, a true portrait of your of, of oh. you, and your ideas and, and inner world, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so I guess this kind of answers this question in some ways, but you know, is this something that, um, you know, somebody had to do this or that it was really a, a very personal mission that you had to do this? Uh, well, yeah, of course. I think I, this is what made me at the end publish it is because I felt that there is very few voices out there who present Palestine or just our existence in a different way. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so uh, I had to do it. <laughs> and I think, again, uh, I think that for any, anybody with any integrity it, and for, you know, when they are in touch and seriously creative and uh, involved in what they do with any integrity you would want you would want to do what you really is called on to do so it, it would definitely be uh, your project nobody else can do it because it is really your project whether it's good or bad but it is really the project that nobody else can do as well Absolutely, yes, because it's it is about it is informed by your perspective. Absolutely, it's very subjective. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so, here is something. Uh, now, the question is really about like kind of if you were to sum this up in one sentence, um, you know, what is what is the question that your project was sort of seeking to answer? Um, do you think it's possible to to uh, boil that down into one sentence or? No, it's difficult, I have to say, but I, I guess um, I had no intentions other than sharing my thought with the universe, whoever is reading it. This is, you know, it was just, a, yeah, just happily sharing. I mean, it's interesting that you put this question with this text, for instance, about uh, Arab nationalism. And I think, you know, that says it all. This is my position. I, I am somebody who has positions on things. And I think what I'm trying to say, this is my position. Yeah, okay. um, can you actually tell a little bit more? Because this definitely, this line gave me, uh, like it, it definitely made me stop and think, you know, it, so it says it may be the idea of Arab nationalism. Sorry, it may be that the idea of Arab nationalism precisely is the idea of the state of Israel. Um, and so, you know, can, can you just give us a little <laughs> insight into like- uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, no problems. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, you know, like just nationalism in mm -hmm. its raw sense, it, in its the way things are, the way it is uh, manifested. I mean, what differentiates what's happening in? Oh, I don't want to start politics. I <laughs> guess. So, I understand. It's just, but, I mean, the state of Israel is based on nationalism, is based on the one identity, the Jewish state, right? So, and if we say we're Arabs or we are Sunni or we are Shia and we are Christians or whatever, this is, or we are only Arabs, we've seen the Kurds, we've seen the uh, Armenians, we've seen so many 
different identities, identities, and we are all of that identities. And you cannot, I mean, I feel my position is weakened with Hamas and Fatah, for instance, against, in, you know, like in trying to end occupation because we're thinking in a very tribal nationalistic way when this is not how I think we're, power can be found. This is where weakness is. And Israel, as far as I'm concerned, is a weak state. Yes, it's it's a superpower, but I think, oh my God, I can't believe I'm there. <laughs> I think that we're doing what Israel is doing to ourselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, you know, I think just even the difficulty with which we're having this conversation is reflective of kind of the the hegemony of discourse, you know, that there are certain things that we are, there are certain, there's a script of like how this shall be discussed. And so when we challenge aspects of the script, um, which I think, you know, in a line like that, it's, it's definitely there's a there's a challenge there. Um, then yeah, I think that we, you will have some reaction, some sort of uh, pushback to that. But um, but it, it's part of I think kind of moving forward in this in this uh, in this new world that we are you know trying to create and and imagining the future of the region. Uh, it is not an easy thing to do for sure. Um, I think not, you know, moving away from the political, but just even um, Afikra as a as a concept. Also, when we talk about, you know, that that Afikra explores the histories and cultures of the Arab world, to think that that can be kind of a a um, controversial or kind of like a, a a point of like, no, there is, you know, is there one Arab culture? You know, ha as Arab nationalism, we do believe that there is like a one, a unified Arab identity. Mm. And to push back on that and to say, actually, we know maybe there are many identities and many different cultures and many different histories um, that make up this mosaic of something that we call Arab mm. uh, is, is a, um, you know. Mm. And I think this is our challenge. Mm. Yes, yes. Mm. Because I'm not Palestinian enough as well. That's mm -hmm. the I mean, because it, it, I mean, if you start breaking it down, you start thinking, you know, you start hearing, so you're Arab, but you're not Palestinian enough because Palestinian enough means, ch -ch 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 -ch. Mm -hmm. and who, who decides those ident those guidelines, those frameworks and, and all that. And, and I think this is a challenge. And honestly, this is a challenge <laughs> only with those who, have the time, the energy, and the politics to discuss it because the average person on the street couldn't care less. I mean, they're not interested in being defined as much as they want to get by and do their thing. Yes, I think that's an uh, absolutely excellent point. Um, I'm gonna, let's keep moving. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, so, um, I think you've spoken about this a bit, you know, you've talked about, uh, you know, your friends and the the support, the early believers and team members that shaped the project, you know, being yes. uh, Yusuf, Racha, and um, you, you also mentioned another friend as oh, well. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm. Uh, anybody else uh, that you... And I think Henri uh, Jules was like a great uh, support. He's uh, my French uh, translator. Mm -hmm. And of course, Marianne Jaraise, who stepped in and did the design for the artwork. Yes, and the, it is beautiful artwork. Here's like a, a bit of a detail of mm -hmm. some of the, the artwork that you'll find in the book. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I'll okay, skip over that question and- Yes. <laughs> Well, it could just uh, my eye on the clock as well. Um, and so what were um, what would you say were some of the turning points or maybe an, an instructive failure? Um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. publishing. Publishing was the, yeah. Mm -hmm. This was a new terrain for me. I didn't know much. I didn't do 
enough. I now, I'm now knowing what I know now, I think I didn't do enough uh, legwork to really find the matching publisher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a you know that those are some of the things I think that people don't necessarily think of, and like like you said, until you're in it, and mm -hmm. um, sort of what you described uh, being kind of trying to be shaped or directed by the publisher, would, would you say that that was the biggest uh, source of challenge? Yeah, or I think it is, I mean, if I'm to give any advice for beginners is uh, really, you really have to find a, match, a publisher that sits on the same bench with you. you. You have the same vision for the work. You, uh, I come from marketing and communications, um, um, background and you know my idea of how you do things is very different than publishing houses in the Arab world and uh, yeah so that is is something that I would ask people to to look out for and, and pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely especially for the sake of preserving your artistic integrity and your personal integrity of course. And, and, and where you want to take your project as well you know where, where do you want to not, not in term, not only in terms of reach but also how you want it to be presented and and how you somebody has to share your vision is is very crucial mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely um i'm exactly yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly that right um, so, you know, when thinking about creative process, you know, I think that uh, a lot of times we see, uh, obviously, we see the final product, we see, um, you know, the book, it's published, it's, uh, or, you know, the exhibition, the, you know, whatever it is. Um, and uh, I often personally li like to kind of get like that behind the curtain look of, you know, what is your, as a, as a poet, as an artist, what is your sort of process, uh, your creative process, um, what does that look like for you uh, in terms of how you approach, um, you know, do you, do you write in the morning? Is it, do you have like a particular place in the house that you like to sit? Is there anything like that that you could share with us? I'm trying to find the process, but it's not, it's not happening. <laughs> no, there isn't a process. Uh, I'm being scolded by my advisors on the fact that there needs to be like some sort of routine that you go into. But I am not, I mean, I write the most when I'm busy, busy doing something else. And this is where I feel like writing. Maybe it's like I run for something else, something exciting that I love. Uh, when I am uh, calm and, uh, you know, relaxed and all of that, I don't try it. I, I can't say I'm writing now. Yeah. So I don't have a process. Yeah. Unfortunately. Your process yeah. is no process. Your process is to just no let process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Plus fair many things. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, mm. So I think uh, that this is also something that we've talked about, knowing what you know now, um, you know, what were, what are some things that you maybe would have prepared for differently? You spoke about um, understanding maybe the publishing world a little bit more. Um, does anything in the else- In world in particular, I mean, I'm, I don't, I cannot speak about anything but the Arab world. I think you really need to figure out how and who is your publisher. Yeah, how, how do you, we, you know, we touched on this maybe in the beginning in terms of giving ourselves permission to, you know, to sort of publish and, and put things out. Mm -hmm. Now that it's out, you know, what does, uh, how do you quantify achievement? What does, it, what does success look like for you? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I mean, there's the, the quantifiable bit is how many copies were sold and how many people are reading, blah, blah, blah. but these numbers I don't have access to. Again, we go back to, to the same uh, place. Uh, but also, I mean, the, these are not uh, indicators of achievement as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's really hearing from somebody I've never heard of and they are moved and touched and inspired by my work. This is an achievement, for instance, for me. But I think my biggest achievement is that I, um, 
I managed to, I mean, you uh, described that I'm an agitator and I think my biggest achievement was actually a month ago when um, my hometown just recognized my existence. <laughs> so fine, I was banned, I was censored previously by the church, by, by the municipalities. But then I was, um, I had the chance to speak to, to one of the mayors and uh, he, he appreciated that I speak and I put things differently and invited me to an event that was, they, they launched and celebrated the filmishmish. So to me, this is like a great achievement. Uh, all the copies could be sold, but this is the only copy that really mattered to me. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds like an incredible experience um, mm. to, to feel that sense of uh, kind of a full circle, but um, mm. how, uh, and, and uh, would you say that you felt that there was kind of a recognition for that agitation that you had, that you had yes. Uh, yes. created? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and, and the ability to say it's okay to have a different voice and still respect that, you know. That is huge. That is great. Significant. Mm -hmm. um, let's move on to, let's see. Um, so what is next for you? What would you um, say is? Um, I have written quite a bit after the <laughs> film Mishmish, after that project. And um, I'm not sure if I'm going to publish as in a book again, but this, there's work happening. So I'm excited. I'm excited about that. So I'm carrying on with my writing the way I like it. Great, absolutely. Um, okay, so I, uh, there's one last question that's not in the slides actually that I kind of wanted to ask. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe it would have made sense to ask it before, but, uh, so there's also something that you called a belonging by necessity and was wondering if you could ex sort of ex expound on that a bit. Um, uh, so it's the, the full quote from Yusuf Racha is, uh, hers is a post-national discourse of belonging by necessity, which in its truth uh, speaks more eloquently to the human condition than to any political ag agenda. Mm. Uh, I think... I think no, no one chooses who they are in the sense of where you're born, your gender, your ranking, your whatever, your environment. And you automatically belong to that, at least in your youth, by the fact that this is what you can identify with. And it's not necessarily the everything that is happening around you. It's not necessarily the political environment. It's not necessarily the religion that is around you. It's just that you happen to be in that and you only know yourself when you are in that or associated with that environment. And I think that is beyond and above anything that can have meaning in our existence, to be honest, because that is much more important than the Palestine that is always written and celebrated as a, as a dreamy, uh, difficult thing to achieve or reach or catch or experience. The truth is that Palestine is me, you know, like I, we're one, we're, you know, there is no, and I'm free, <laughs> you know, so, so, in so many ways, this is how I feel about my existence. And this is how I, what I would like to impart with others that who you are is much more dynamic and is much more versatile and greater than what's written in text, history textbooks or what is taught to you by your, uh, I don't know, church or mosque or blah, blah, blah. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's how I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I answered. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, that's a, a beautifully put that, you know, we are much, uh, we are much more complex and dynamic than, 
the the labels that we sometimes um, find put on us. So mm. Mm. we have a, a request to hear some of your poetry, which I have to second. Um, would you? <laughs> With, uh, I'm a horrible reader and I can't read in English for sure. No, in Arabic you can read. Uh, can you, would you like to read in, in Arabic? Uh, any of I'll the try. Um, you know, like, yeah, I'll try. Thank you. Um, okay. Anam wa ahlam. Hulm la yaliku with the war. Hakada sayopal. Umaris will hub ala nasi at tariq. Takata babila mood ala alagla. لا أرى وجه حبيبي ولا أسمع له أني شاحنات وجنزرات تمر من جانبنا نرتعش وكأن ريح صيف أخذتنا أقطع الشارع مسرعة ألوح له بيدي أرى وجهه الهارب من بعيد لا شيء فيه, فيه يشبهني أحس بنهم من الأشياء أجلس على حافة الطريق أركب تزاحم البشر وأحلم أني في حلمي أحمل بحسن أشعث يولد في العشرين لا يعرف غير أمه والشارع نمشي سويا نحو البيت يحدثني بولع عن المعركة لم نستسلم يضحك أعترف له بخوفي يعد لي الشاي ألم أسفل بطني يجبرنا على أخذ هيئة جنين يغطيني يهدهدني كطفلة أنتم لم تعرفوا الفرح فتمتم على الخوف أنام على وقع, على وقع صوته طلعات غارات وهمية اختراق لحاجز الصوت يوقدني ما زال الوقت صامتا في هذا المكان أقلب بين المحطات الفضائية أخجل من تفاوت الموقف أشرع في الترتيب هذا ما أفعله في العادة لطرد شبح ما كل شيء في مكانه إلا أنا أتذكر أن فلسطين ما زالت على قائمة الأولويات ألعن اليقين والمكان Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to encourage anybody to type any questions. Um, and uh, while that's happening, yes, a lot of appreciation for the for the um, Thank you. for that. Really beautiful. I'm glad that we got to hear it in Arabic. Um, I can't read my poems in English. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I can imagine. Of course, it's, you know, the, the source is Arabic. So, okay, we have a question. Um, okay, so the questions are starting to come in. Before we start the questions, I'll, I'll just, actually, yeah. So which poetry um, do you love to read? What's, what are some of the poets that you read? Ah, oh, this is a tough one. Uh, I don't like reading poetry oftentimes, I have to say. And many of the writers that I know are partly poets, partly writers, like Hassan Barghouti, Hassan Barghouti. I love Yusuf Raha's uh, poetry. Um, and I think like, for instance, somebody like Hassan Blasem, who doesn't write poetry at all, but to me, this is what poetry is. It's just the way the expressions that are used and, and the way the um, ideas are communicated. It's, there's poetry about it, even if it's not in a poetry format. Mm. Yeah. Okay, um, this next question is from Reem, and uh, she asks, um, how experimental would you say your writing is? Um, I don't know. Um, it could be very, <laughs> it could be very, because I have no boundaries. And it's just that I play with words and ideas uh, more than words sometimes. And this is more important to me than the actual format of the, the final text. So in, in a way, it is organically experimental because I'm, I'm playing and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure things out as, as they move. So I'm, I'm not set to write a poem in a certain way at any time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, great. So, 
Um, we have a couple, this is like a quick uh, sort of lightning round of um, quick Q and A, just to get to know a little bit more about you. So what is something that you are reading or watching right now? Mm. I'm embarrassed to say I'm watching uh, Seinfeld because it's on yep. Netflix <laughs> and I'm reading, uh, finally I got a copy of uh, Tilka al uh, uh, oh my God, Sana Allah Ibrahim. I've been wanting to find this copy and finally I, I managed to get it. Uh, see, this is a, it's, it's a quali qualified as a, as a, as a riway, as a novel, but I think of it as poetry. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? They don't have to be um, alive. Um, uh, I would have loved to be aware around my great grandmother, Jamila, her name was. Mm. That's somebody I would have loved to remember in detail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, she she lived uh, uh, quite an interesting time. She she lived with the Ottomans, the British, the Israelis, the Jordanians, and the Israelis. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. I'm sure she would have amazing stories to tell for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think people most misunderstand about your work? Um. Uh, again, I think the, the idea is because oftentimes it's political, oftentimes it's explicit about um, uh, my position on the church. Uh, I'm not out there to get somebody. I'm just <laughs> expressing myself. Yes. Right. So maybe not no, no agenda. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no agenda. Yeah. And I guess whose work do you admire and are inspired by? I mean, other than the people I've mentioned, um, uh, Jean Genet, I think, is somebody that I'm inspired with. Uh, and um, definitely uh, uh, Sana Al Ibrahim and Hussein Barouzi. Amazing. Mm. Wonderful. Um, so that is that. Uh, let me sorry one more there we go that i think wraps up our conversation i just want to thank you so much for um taking this time with us and um hope you enjoyed um talking with me as well and uh really just i encourage everybody to to check out the poem the book of poems the, in the time of the apricots um some really amazing poetry um, thank you Nisreen, so much thank you it was a pleasure being with you that's, uh, I'm not sure how to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>